to the end. Go right ahead. Go ahead. Okay, so um, yoga is 1% theory, though, in 99% practice. So I'm not going to be up here talking too much longer about yoga. We're actually going to experience it. And we can do that sitting in chairs. It'll be a little bit different than I normally do, but actually I have a friend that um, has a weekly class where she teaches um, a group of about 20 to 25 people in their, in their wheelchairs with mm -hmm. elderly people, and they love it. They in, enjoy it very much, and they get a lot out of it. So we can do a little something here. I think we're going to do like a 20-minute practice all together, and I'll give you a little guided meditation after. A lot of people are confused about how to meditate, mm -hmm. too. So it's actually very simple. It's very simple. You just have to stop identifying with your thoughts. You don't. You can never stop your thoughts. You might as well hit yourself over the head with a hammer. It's not going to happen. But it's not becoming attached to the thoughts or you know, um, identifying with the false self, which is the ego or the thoughts. It's going behind that, and you will see that uh, when we practice. There is. Uh, there's a word in yoga called kundalini. For those of you that have taken yoga classes before, does, did the teacher use that word at all? Kundalini. What you're trying to do is, is move the kundalini. No? Do you remember that? Okay. Well, um, the ancient spiritual language of yoga is called Sanskrit, much like Latin is the ancient spiritual language of Catholicism. So kundalini means the uh, coiled this serpent because it's recognized <laughs> as it's coiled up down in your energetic body and what we try and do is move kundalini. Kundalini is the equivalent of the Holy Spirit in Catholicism. That's all it is. The Holy Spirit. So what we try and do is activate the Holy Spirit when we do yoga. But a lot of yoga teachers don't get into this. They just, it's, we're just going to move our body and stretch and breathe, which is fine because you know what? Kundalini will be activated anyways. You don't have to even know any of that. Um, but basically, Kundalini is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit Kundalini being your consciousness. So what we try to do in yoga is to raise the level of our consciousness out of the level, lower levels that it may tend to fall for some people. For example, shame, guilt, apathy, fear. Lower levels that keep us mired in our kind of our muck, our addictions, fears. Hi. All of that. Okay, so the higher levels of consciousness that we want to reach are obviously unconditional love. That's where we want to go, right? Especially with the Holy Spirit. With Kundalini, it's the same thing. We want to get to the level where we are a high vibration, not a low vibration. Okay, so unconditional love, um, forgiveness, acceptance, <coughs> these levels of consciousness, once you are there and you're really there, they create miracles in your life, right? Sometimes people have a misconception about love. They, they visualize the romantic type of love, but it's not at all the same. Sometimes that can actually lead to hatred. I think many of you out there <laughs> might already know that, right? I mean, right? Where, oh, I love you, and then, you know, a year later, I hate you. That's just not it. So um, you want to get to that, the higher levels of consciousness. How do you know that you're, that you're vibrating high at the level of unconditional love? Some people say, you know, you've heard the word enlightenment. You know, that. Yeah, you're pretty much enlightened when you reach the level of unconditional love. Um, you stop to live your life selfishly. In other words, what can I get from you? What can you give me? How can I use you? Your life will be more, what can I do for you? What can I give to you? What can I, how can I serve you? Because enlightenment is just one thing, recognizing the oneness of everything. The one, how everything is really joined together, that we are not separate from each other, even though physically it might appear to be. But that spirit that is in all of us, it's all one, it's all connected. So what I do for you, I do for me. So I won't act selfishly anymore because I know that that's hurting me. 
but it won't even be a question. It would just be automatic, you know. It, and you know, the most enlightened people are probably the one, the most humblest. You won't even know they're your neighbor or the person sitting next to you tonight. There's somebody who lives their life very calmly, no drama, very, very <coughs> discreet, um, and they do their work probably silently. Although there are some that were that are a little bit more out there and active. Um, so that's, and it's all just to be happy, because that is the aim of all yoga practices, and what you're doing here, too. We just want to be happy as human beings. So the aim of all yoga practices is happiness. And to see the divine in everyone, because that's the aim of all true religions, is to see the divine in everything and everyone. So it works well, it complements a religion. So I want, to get, I want to be very clear, because there is a lot of that out there that people say, be careful of yoga, be careful, you know, it's, it's Hinduism. Hinduism came after yoga, by the way. Hindu is an organized religion, and it adopted a lot of the principles of yoga and put them in their Bhagavad Gita, which is the equivalent of our Bible, like our New Testament. So uh, yoga goes back about 3,000 years. They don't, they're not quite sure. About 3,000 years. The yoga scriptures came actually before the, the uh, Bible did yoga, the yoga scriptures. But um, it's all in praise of, of the divine and recognizing that we are that. You know, we don't have to go looking out there. We look outside of ourselves all the time for love, acceptance, truth, and beauty. But it's in here. The kingdom of heaven is within. It's in us. Jesus said it, right? And he also said, God is love. So that's what we're aiming for in yoga, unconditional love. We're hardwired to find God, to find that love. But we seek it in places that, uh, what's that country western song? Looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> and it's like a fish looking for water, right? But it's so hard to kind of grasp it. That's why yoga is experiential. I can stand up here all night and talk about it. But it's like trying to explain what an orange tastes like. You just have to kind of peel the orange, taste it, and then, oh, okay, now I get it. Um, like I said, I was tricked into going to my first yoga class um, by a friend. I was living in Miami at the time and was into working out with weights and had a personal trainer and bike riding. And, um, and one day we went to an aerobics class and the studio was closed. So she said, oh, well, in an hour, there's a yoga class down the street. You know, let's, let's go. And I'm like, no, I went to a yoga class before. It's too boring. I don't want to do that. I want to feel the burn, feel the pain. I want to lose weight. I want to look good. Somehow she convinced me that, no, you'll really like this teacher. It's a great class to go. So an hour later, I went down the street. She never showed up, my friend. But I proceeded to take the class. <laughs> Anyways, I consider her an angel. Okay? She kind of told me to go there. No, no, resistance, acceptance. And I went. And um, I was hooked the first time on the level of the physical, because it was a type of yoga where they heat the room to 110 degrees. And you go through these past 26 postures repeated twice. And I couldn't believe what the other people in the room were doing. You know, talk about twisting into pretzels. Some of them. Some of them not. So they were just all doing what they could at their level. I was so sore the next day, I couldn't walk. My, I could tell that I worked out muscles that I hadn't worked out before. So that's why I went back for more pain. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it was probably about the fourth or fifth class a couple weeks later where I started to recognize the mental. I recognized a shift of awareness in my mind. I started to think about what I was saying before I spoke. I started to think about what I was going to eat before I ate. I was starting to recognize some of the things that weren't working out in maybe relationships I was in with friends and a boyfriend at the time and you know more awareness so I would say that if I had to define yoga in two words from that physical part it would be <coughs> awareness and relaxation